to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Miller. I'm a stroke survivor and grateful recovering alcoholic. Today's topic is overcoming challenges. So I want to talk about the daily challenges I faced post-stroke with the neurological vision impairment and the trials and triumphs in daily life. Um, I want to talk about some of the tasks that are simple to complex, which uh, can be obstacles for me, and strategies that I use to overcome these hurdles. So this is just a little more detail, um, continuing to go deeper into um, what my experiences have been with neurological vision impairment. And the most obvious hurdle that comes to mind first is using digital devices. And I'm sure this sounds like a luxury problem, but if you think about all that we do in modern day that has a digitized screen, you'll begin to wrap your head around the obstacle, the obstacles that I'm facing. So just to give you perspective on what hurts my head, Um, I created just a little list here. So things, the obvious ones are the phone and the computer and the TV, which is what I've talked about. But there are also things like the clock on the stovetop and the coffee maker uh, selection screen uh, and dial and, uh, and my watch. So these are just a few of the things that have digital screens. And it's like, uh, you know, our thermo- our thermostat in the house also has a digital screen. And the more that uh, we go and try to make our home a smart home, everything is digitized. So um, it can be challenging. It just, um, there's more things that I need to train myself to look away from. So to address these challenges, first of all, I've had to accept that I actually have a problem. And as you know, that, uh, that's been a challenge for me. Um, I can't keep acting like I don't have a problem because it's just making my pain worse. So this acceptance has been an ongoing process, but I feel like I've made some really great progress lately um, in the area of acceptance. I've become incredibly self-aware, more self-aware than I think a normal person needs to be. Um, I'm very aware of what my eyes are doing all the time. So when I'm talking and um and doing really anything, um, I'm always paying attention to how much my eyes are moving and I'm trying to make them stop moving. Um, so I make a conscious effort to not look at digital devices. Usually our eyes are attracted to these things and I've been learning to make it a habit of looking away rather than looking toward or at. And I actually, so what I mean by that is if I'm sitting in the living room and I want to know what time it is, it's natural for me to look across the room at the clock on the stove. And I have to make it a habit to ask my phone what time it is instead. Um, And it just, it takes practice, just like everything else. Um, So I actually, I don't wear my Apple Watch anymore, sadly, because it hurts my head. And and when I have it on, obviously, I'm going to look at it. I've even tried, like, just turning off vibrate, so I only, you know, but what do I need to look at it for, honestly? Like, I like the fact that it uh, it tracks things and it also can give you like alerts if it identifies anything, you know, wrong, like 
irregular heartbeat or or that kind of thing. I know that it can identify AFib for people. And and so um, it's kind of a shame that I'm not wearing it. But um, just like with my phone and all four of our Alexa devices in our house, we call them Bezos devices so that they don't... Um, they don't say, uh, can you repeat that whenever we say the word, um, when we're talking about them. So, um, all four of our Bezos devices in our house. And, um, so just like with all of these things, I just ask them for what I need. So I'll ask what time it is. I'll ask what the weather is today. That's what I do every morning. I ask it what the weather is today. And, um, I ask it, what do I have on my calendar for today? So I think these, you know, the way that it's supposed to really be an assistant for you, I'm utilizing that. I'm leveraging that um, instead of looking at the device. So I'm not necessarily suffering in any way without my fancy Apple Watch, even though I miss all that other stuff. Um, like tracking. I used to walk or I used to run and walk and um, I'd go like four miles a day, uh, something like that. And so I would use my watch for tracking all this stuff. And I had um, a group of people that we would all be linked together. So whenever we would do anything, any exercise, um, it would ping each other and stuff. And I really loved doing that. It was really encouraging to work out together and stuff like that, even though we were apart. But, um, so I haven't been able to do that, but these are just nice to haves. And, um, I'm not moving right now as much anyway. Um, and I'll talk about some of my exercise routine, but as for my, my phone, I'm a huge fan of voiceover So, um, I think the biggest, like the coolest thing about my experience with voiceover is that I taught myself how to use it. I don't know how other people learn how to use it. I was looking for classes, um, but I couldn't find anything for voiceover courses. Um, basically there's a tutorial on your Mac and there's a, um, I don't know. I don't know that there's a tutorial on your phone. Um, but I listened to YouTube videos over and over and over again. Sometimes I listened to the exact same video over and over again and practiced what it was saying that you do until I figured it out. So what I, I think my hurdle was and still is with the Mac, but initially with the phone, the hurdle was trying to visualize what I was doing on the phone. So for example, like, um, there's a thing on the, with voiceover called a rotor. So when you have voiceover turned on, on your phone, this rotor is in my opinion, the core of using voiceover actually on your phone and on your computer. So if you imagine a rotor or a dial that you turn in order to interact with a specific capability on your car, it's just like that. Like say, for example, you want to adjust your right side mirror, you turn the dial on your console to the word right, and then the directional buttons are able to move the right mirror. And if you wanted to move your left mirror, you turn the dial to the word left, and then you use the arrows to um, control the left mirror. So it's just like that. And when you have voiceover enabled on your phone, you can put your fingers on the screen. So in my case, the screen is black. I just have it completely black, so I can't see anything. But if you put your fingers on the screen and you position them in a way like you're turning a dial and then you actually like turn them, you know, like move them in a turning um, way, it will announce different 
various features that are available on the rotor, and you can turn it clockwise or counterclockwise. So one of the cool things that I learned how to do, and I still have a long way to go for sure, but I think I've made the most progress on my phone. Um, one of the things that is really cool is, you know, my phone, I do not have my phone home screen optimized. So like some people have all similar apps like group together and I don't have that. I just have like five or six screens of apps. And so when I was using my eyes, I would just flip through and find the app that I want and select it. But without being able to see which screen I'm on. I mean, I started just remembering what screen all of the apps were on. But um, without having that, what you can do is turn the rotor to um, handwriting. It'll say handwriting, and then you uh, start writing the letters of the app that you want on the screen. And when it announces the app that you want, you just double click on the screen and it opens the app. It's kind of cool. And so I can pretty much do anything I want on my phone without looking at it now. Um, there's probably some shortcuts to doing some things, um, but I'm still learning, but, uh, at least I can, I think the main thing that I wanted to do was communicate with people. And so I'm a whiz at texting now <laughs> for sure. But, um, my Mac is another story. I keep coming to a roadblock with that and it's really just my patience learning it. Um, I'll get to this point where I'm, you know, I have the screen black and I'm browsing and, I open like a PDF within Chrome and then I just cannot figure out how to get it to read the text within the PDF within Chrome. Um, so I end up after, I don't know, 20 minutes trying to figure it out. Um, I just lose my patience and then I stop. And then if I stop because I've lost my patience, it's really difficult for me to pick it back up again. So I think now that I've said it aloud, I will try to pick it back up again, maybe a half hour a day. There is a tutorial on your Mac to learn voiceover, and I've only gotten through like, I don't even know, maybe a quarter of it uh, because I keep getting to this point where I get, I, I'm like, oh, I'll just learn it without without the tutorial and that's when I start getting frustrated so um I'll go back to the drawing board you know I've got all the time in the world so um we'll figure that out and um see if I can try to find patience you know my morning meeting my morning sobriety meeting this morning was about patience so now I need to maybe go back and listen to that uh meditation on the calm app that we listened to about patience um, okay, so switching gears, another challenge in my daily life with my disability has been maintaining focus on someone's face during the length of a conversation. And um, what it feels like is a sense of strain in my head, my temples, and my eyes, or an aching or fatigue in my head and the sensations start out kind of above my temples on either side of my head but most often it's on the left side of my head which is where the stroke was so I don't know I think that's interesting uh, that the place you know, I wonder if like the place where I had the stroke is the place that hurts. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, as awkward as it feels when I start feeling though that discomfort set in, I just look down away from whoever it is I'm talking to and I soften my gaze. So looking down may mean looking at the ground. It may mean looking at the table, wherever I'm I'm sitting, I just look down. That's a solution because I know whatever is below me is not moving and is not bright. 
if I look to the left or the right or up, um, something could be moving in that direction or something could be bright, like a light or the sun or something. So the easiest thing for me to do is look down and then I soften my gaze and it feels, so this, this uh, action that I take looking down, this is what I, I was thinking today. What, how can I explain what this is similar to? So my head, when I'm looking at somebody as they're talking to me and I'm trying to remain focused on their eyes, their face, um, it feels similar to when you try to like hold a flex arm hang until you start shaking and then you let go. Like me keeping focus on the person's face is like that kind of strain, aching, fatigue. It's like I need to let go. That's what it feels like. And so when I quote unquote let go or look down, then my head still hurts, just like your arms would still feel that fatigue and kind of achiness uh, or strain. It's still, you still feel it when you let go, but with time, your arms feel more like they've swelled and they're no longer straining. That's what my head feels like. It feels like over time, once I look down, it feels like the straining is decreasing, but the, it has swelled and gotten heavy. That's what my head feels like, if that makes sense. It makes sense to me, so <laughs> that's all that matters. I thought that was a good analogy for what the discomfort feels like. So I spent a lot of time looking down, and after consciously making an effort to hold my head up uh, my whole life for my posture and my bad back. Now I'm going back to keeping my head down <laughs> all the time. Um, so sometimes I'll just let people know if, you know, I'm going out to lunch or dinner with somebody or if I have a visitor and they're coming over to visit with me, um, I'll usually let them know ahead of time that at any point I may need to just look down if my head starts hurting. And they usually say, just do whatever you need to do. It's just awkward for me to, um, you know, <laughs> I think it's because whenever I am disengaged in a conversation, you know how you'll just like look around the room like, when will they stop talking? Well, that's what it feels like that I'm doing to somebody, but I'm actually still engaged in the conversation. So it feels rude. So, okay, so that's one, another one. And then let's see, walking is another simple task that bothers me. And I've recently been trying out something new with walking. And um, I pretty much just walk around the block. So I've talked about this before. My house has lots of different sidewalks and paths and stuff that are just one block away from my house. So I have lots of different options that are still only one block. So that's really nice. And so here's the thing that I've been trying. I'm trying to, again, soften my gaze while I'm walking and look towards something large whose perspective doesn't shift as I get closer to it. So for example, looking toward an area, a whole area of concrete or grass or pavement. So if I'm walking from my house over to the elementary school, which is just a block away, as I walk closer to the school, I'm looking at a field of grass, and that way I'm not having to, there's no specific area or specific point of reference. An area that doesn't require my eyes to converge the image and that has no movement. So if I were to look at a road and there are cars driving by on it, that would not be helpful. But if I'm walking, um, 
I don't know, if I'm walking down the street and there's a parking lot, I will just look at the, at the pavement in the parking lot, not at any specific point, just like kind of softening my gaze, gaze and just looking at black, you know, looking at whatever the color is rather than what the thing is, if that makes sense. And that seems to help me a little bit. I, I wouldn't say that I can walk further distances. Um, I think it's just uh, minimizes my discomfort a little bit so that I don't necessarily get nauseous. Uh, one thing that is difficult is if I'm walking my dog, Boris, <laughs> who's really short and fat and right, and usually walks right beside me, um, I tend to look at the ground because that's where he is. And the ground's moving really fast when you're walking. So um, that bothers my head. So I have to make a conscious effort not to look at him when we're walking. So these are some of the struggles. So um, I'll give you one more challenge for today and how I've overcome it to satisfy my need. Um, and that's to exercise. So I, I have picked yoga back up, which... Um, was something that I had been hoping to do because I had abandoned it after I had my stroke. And so I have picked it back up. And, um, but it's something that I need to be really cautious with. I'm used to what I used to do before my stroke was I did yoga every day at four o'clock and I did a one hour power yoga. And, um, this is just something that I can't do to the, that extreme. And being like an all or nothing kind of person, it's a little challenging for me to listen to my body um, and do what my body tells me is okay rather than what my head, my stubborn head tells me to do. So if I'm having a day that I feel especially unstable with headaches or nausea, I will not do an hour of yoga. Um, I'll only do part of it. And again, this is totally foreign to me <laughs> to do only part of something. So, but I'll start like the normal routine and then I'll just stop after 10 or 15 minutes. And it feels, it feels very incomplete <clears throat> to get to like a certain point that I'm used to just continuing. It's like right when I get to the point where I'm really into it, uh, then I have to stop. So it's like, uh, it's like singing the national anthem and then, uh, just up until the last note and then you just stop or like singing happy birthday and not blowing out the candle. <laughs> um, anyway, I have a million of those from they're from uh, an episode of Big Bang Theory. <laughs> anyway, if there's any Big Bang Theory uh, fans out there, but my favorite exercise in recovery is lifting weights. And I've tried to shift from weights to yoga full time, but it's just not meeting me where my body is and where my body needs to be. So since I've always enjoyed lifting weights ever since high school, when I was on the softball team in high school, I've always liked lifting weights. And so instead of trying to shift away to yoga, which seems to be not entirely, you know, like I said, just meeting me where I need to be, I've uh, added some weightlifting uh, new weightlifting stuff to my my weightlifting routine. So there's a gym nearby, but it's further than one block. It's about, I don't know, four blocks maybe. And it's that would just cause me too much discomfort to walk all the way there and then and then do exercise. So that's not really what I can do right now. So instead, I have some arm weights at home, and I have some leg weights that I bought that wrap around your leg, so you can do like leg lifts and stuff, and I have an exercise ball, which I have found to be pretty tough on the abs, and 
if you lay on your back and like hold the big gigantic exercise ball between your ankles and then you do some creative movements like it's killer on your stomach. So I've actually added some new movements with my arm weights and I'm just I'm just doing the basics with my legs right now because I have a really bad back um, from my Weimaraner pulling me on the leash. Um, every once in a while, like she's very trained, but every once in a while she'll um, want to attack something, <laughs> to, to put it lightly. And so she'll like run at it and, and yank my shoulder and the pain goes all the way from my right shoulder down to my, the bottom of my back, like all the way down. So I need to strengthen the muscles there because that's what I learned. When something hurts, you have to exercise it. So, um, yeah, so I've been adding some stuff to my arms, a little bit of the legs, exercise ball for the abs, and of course, my beloved push-ups. That's my absolute favorite is my push-ups. So um, I've actually seen some results in my arms over the past five months since I've been doing like really diving into my push-ups and my arm weight. So that's kind of cool. It's always nice to see results. And yeah, it's taken five months for me to see results because I'm doing it really slowly in a sustainable way. I'm not increasing my weights at all. I'm increasing the number of times I do reps. So uh, same with push-ups. I'm not doing anything more than continuing to increase the number of push-ups slowly. I mean, we're talking like one one additional push up like every uh i don't know a month you know um i also improve if i don't want to add another push up i'll just improve my my uh form and you know do the push up all the way to the floor like touch my nose to the floor kind of thing um and i've been enjoying that so i'm going to keep doing that so these are just a few of my daily challenges post-stroke with vision impairment. And I'm sharing these definitely not to complain, but to introduce hope to anyone suffering from daily challenges. And we are all, there's all always something, you know, we all have our own daily challenges and there is an answer and I just have to have the willingness to be open to it. Um, and when I was really frustrated in the beginning of all of this, I was really more angry and frustrated that I couldn't go running and walking than I was being willing to find a replacement for these things because what I wanted was to get my heart rate up, and I didn't feel like there was any way to do that other than cardio, and I have found that all of these exercises can get my heart rate up, and, um, and so it was really, a, it took the willingness to be open to trying new things. So these solutions that I have found so far have made me feel empowered to overcome the hurdles that I have yet to face. I'm sure there's more ahead of me. And these small victories give me momentum to keep reaching further and moving forward. So thanks for listening today. And if you are on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn, you can find me, Rachel Miller, Recovery Daily. There's a lot going on in recovery outside of the podcast, including um, I have a fun little fashion show that I update, um, not daily, but almost daily. Um, and these are just like, I was, I was wearing, I found myself wearing like pajamas 
and tank tops and t-shirts and sweatpants every day. And I was like, I can't keep doing this. Like, I don't even feel like a human being anymore. So my niece took me shopping. My niece and her friend took me shopping. And I also dove back into my professional career closet. And I've just been wearing the stuff that I normally would wear to work. Um, But I'm dressing it down and it's kind of fun. I've been enjoying it. So I post pictures of what I'm wearing and uh, what I'm doing in recovery. That brings me joy. And I also have updates with my bulldog, Boris, and my Weimaraner, Autumn. These are my puppies. And I have pictures of my baking and all kinds of stuff that fill my fill my days. I'm I'm one thing that I've remained is a bit busy body. So um, okay, so that's all I have. So I will talk to you tomorrow.